So today we're going to get started in on chapter 9, which is spectral elucidation, or structural elucidation, I should say, using spectra. Up to this point, how have you determined the structure of your molecules in the laboratory? You've used IR, but did that determine the actual structure? What did it determine? Functional groups, right? Yeah, so you've gotten a lot of functional group information from IR. What else have you used to determine structure of what you had? Pardon? Okay, well, we can use polarimetry to determine whether or not we have one enantiomer over the other. What kind of physical property? Okay, boiling point, melting point. Okay. Using what kind of techniques? Say it. Gas chromatography was one way. What was another way? Uh -huh. And thin layer chromatography, right? So all of those techniques, right, to really determine what you have, you're really dependent on having a standard of known structure, right, that which you're comparing to. That's not always the case, right? Sometimes organic chemists discover new molecules. For example, one of the individuals who was on my PhD committee, uh, Dr. Francis Schmitz at the University of Oklahoma, he was a marine uh, natural products chemist. And so his, it's kind of funny, Oklahoma has no borders to an ocean, but yet he was a marine a natural products chemist. And every year when he was active, Anyway, he took his graduate students to Hawaii, and they went diving uh, and collected specimens and then brought them back and spent the whole year trying to discover whether or not there were any anti-cancer components in these various sponges, mollusks, whatever the case may be, okay? <laughs> eh, probably. But he's very fa fairly famous at it. And a lot of times they would find compounds that were unknown. And they had to determine the structure, because if we don't know the structure, we really don't know much, right? You know that this particular compound that you have may be pure, you know uh, maybe it's melting point, it's boiling point, but a lot of things have boiling points and melting points that are very similar. And, you know, he had uh, collaborations with Novartis and other pharmaceutical companies, and they wanted to know what is that compound so that we can have our chemists synthesize it and perhaps commercialize that particular anti-cancer compound. <coughs> well, it turns out that NMR spectroscopy, and there are two flavors that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about proton NMR today, and then uh, when we meet on Monday, we'll talk about carbon NMR. Okay, but NMR spectroscopy allows us to determine structure very, very nicely. Okay, NMR is actually an extremely complicated technique in a lot of respects, but we're going to only deal with the proton and the carbon the much more simple aspects of NMR, okay, so the foundational stuff. However, we do have a structural elucidation course, Chemistry 404, that as you get higher up, if you decide that you want to learn more about it, you can take that course and learn all kinds of stuff about 2D NMR and 3D NMR and how to put together huge and complex structures uh, from NMR spectroscopy data. We're going to keep it pretty simple to small molecules in this class, okay? You all are all familiar with NMR, and NMR stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, okay? But you're probably more familiar with NMR as MRI, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Imaging. How many people know somebody that's had an MRI performed? Yeah, pretty much so all of you, right? MRI is a machine, right, that allows us to get these images uh, inside the body. And it does it using an NMR experiment, just like what we're going to do in this class. Okay, so it, MRI technicians are actually performing nuclear magnetic resonance experiments on human beings. What is the human body mostly composed of? Water. And water is primarily composed of, of what? Oxygen. Hydrogen. In terms of the number of atoms, it's hydrogen. By weight, you're right, it's oxygen. But by number of atoms, it's hydrogen, and hydrogen is a proton, right? And so they're actually doing proton NMR experiments on you uh, 
to get these images. And the nice thing about MRI is it's non-invasive, right? It's not using X-ray radiation, which is harmful. It's a non-invasive uh, technique. It's used an awful lot. And so I'm not a doctor, so I can't really comment on this, but they're saying that this is a compression of a, of a disc. Okay, I guess so. Uh, but most importantly, this is so important that a 2003 Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to a chemist and a physicist for development of this or for their contributions towards this field, okay? Now, MRI, you get these pretty little pictures because you have to have these pretty little pictures so a doctor can understand it, okay? But chemists don't get pretty little pictures. We get little lines that we have to interpret, okay? And we have to build the picture from that, okay? So the uh, instrument that you see here is probably several million dollars. The instrument that we have down in the... Um, down in our NMR lab, uh, $400,000 for one of them, $300,000 for the other, and they just sit there. They look like R2-D2 kind of cans, and they don't do a whole lot physically, but they are very, very useful uh, instruments. All right? Now, whereas doctors are going to look at things like this from their NMR experiments, chemists look at things like this. Okay? Doesn't look like a molecule, does it? I mean, we see some lines, okay? And so this is the MRI of organic molecules. Now, when I see this, I see a line that corresponds to a tert-butyl group, and I see a line that corresponds to a methyl group in this particular structure. This is methyl tert-butyl ether. Anybody know what methyl tert-butyl ether has been used for in the past? It used to be a gasoline additive. You have to add oxygenating agents to... Uh, gasoline to, to help prevent smog formation. And we used to use methyl tert-butyl ether for it. We no longer use that because it turns out it leaches out of tanks and gets into the groundwater. That's why they like to use ethanol now. If ethanol gets into the groundwater, well, you're just having a dilute martini, right? Methyl tert-butyl ether gets into the groundwater, mm, you're drinking a carcinogen. So, a uh, little different, okay? So, what, what, what do you see when you look at this? What do you see at this point? You see lines. What else do you see? One of the lines is bigger. Okay, we have a line that's bigger. That's right. And we have a line that's smaller. What about this line? <coughs> it's at zero, and this, this is what we call a standard that is added to define zero. And this is actually tetramethylsilane is what our, our standard is, okay? TMS. We're going to ignore that because it's there just to define what zero is. But then we also have this scale on the bottom, right? And we call that chemical shift. And it's in parts per million. But notice that the hydrogens that are attached to this carbon are not at the same chemical shift as the hydrogens that are on these carbons. All right? Why might that be the case? Partially true. More carbons. Okay. What about this one? No. Um, well, for each carbon, there's three hydrogens here. And for each carbon on this one, there's three hydrogens. The oxygen. The oxygen. That's exactly right. What do we know about the difference between oxygen and carbon? Electronegativity. electronegativity. So what's this telling us about having electronegative atoms attached to the carbon? It causes a different chemical shift towards closer to 10, right, than, than to zero, right? And so we're going to learn about what affects chemical shift um, and how we can use that to our advantage, okay? Now, this is a simple molecule. This is a little more complicated. This is ethyl bromide. Now what's kind of strange? You've got multiple lines. I've got multiple lines for each one of these signals. That's right. This is a signal. And this signal corresponds to these three hydrogens, right? How do you know that? Because I colored them the same, right? <laughs> but we're going to learn how to figure that out later. Why is it referred to as the hydrogen? Pardon? Why is it referred to as Because this is proton NMR. So it's only looking at the protons, which are the hydrogens. So in this particular NMR experiment, we're not looking at the carbons themselves. We will, on Monday, start talking about how we can look at the carbons. 
but right now we're only looking at the hydrogen. Okay? And so this is a blow up of the region so that you can clearly see that this signal, this is a signal corresponding to these two hydrogens, but it's not a single line. Right? It's not a single light, it's split. We say that it's a split signal. Okay? And how many lines is these two hydrogens split into? Four. And these three hydrogens are split into. So, huh, why is that? Yeah, that's right. They can see the neighbors, right? So if you look at these two hydrogens, how many neighbors do they have? Neighboring hydrogens? Three, right? And so these two hydrogens are split into what we call a quartet. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So how about these three hydrogens, how many neighbors do they have? Two, and so it's split into three lines. So if you had to come up with a mathematical equation, how would you represent the number of splittings? The number of splittings is equal to the number of neighbors plus what? Plus one, and that's gonna be the n plus one rule that we look at. There's a lot of information here. I'm getting information on the chemical shift. I know that this must be attached to a carbon atom that has an electronegative atom attached to it, and in fact that's the case because it's further downfield, as we call it. This one must be on a carbon atom that's not attached to anything that's electronegative, or not directly attached to anything that's electronegative because it's shifted more upfield. And so I can tell that I've got, to ha I've got two unique environments, okay? the methyl group and the methylene group, but I can also tell what the neighbors are by looking at the splitting. I know that this methyl group is attached to a carbon with two hydrogens based on how these things are split. We're starting to get a lot of structural information and we can start to put the pieces together and start putting together the puzzle of what this really looks like. Now, let's talk a little bit about the physics of how NMR works. <clears throat> oh, I heard that. Oh. We're going to keep the physics simple, all right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do uh, play in the sandbox kind of physics, okay? Stuff that, and I, and I kid you not, every five-year-old intuitively knows because they play with their toys, okay? So, everybody's played with magnets before, right? All right. Well, it turns out that a proton has a charge. What's the charge on a proton? It's positive, right? And what happens if I take a charge and I move it? Think about making the old electromagnet, right? You wrap a nail with a wire and you hook it to a battery, you've got charge flowing through the wire. What happens to the nail? Well, the wire goes around, but what happens to the nail? It becomes a magnet, right? It becomes an electromagnet. <laughs> well, I have this proton in the hydrogen atom. It's charged, and it turns out that these protons don't just sit there. They actually move. They spin. So if I take a positively charged proton and I spin it, what am I generating? Force. I'm generating a magnetic force, a, a magnetic field. Okay? And so these uh, little magnets... We can detect magnets pretty easily, right? As a kid, how did you detect whether or not you had a magnet? Stuck it to a fridge. Stuck it to a fridge, right? That was one way to do it. Well, you're not going to take your molecule and stick it to a fridge. We're going to put in an NMR spectrometer that allows us to detect whether or not we have uh, these spinning protons, as we like to call them. But these little protons, right, are sitting there spinning. And they are spinning and generating a magnetic field. And we have a north pole and we have a south pole, just like a typical bar magnet. And we can use this to our advantage. Okay? The cool thing about this is, is that all organic molecules have what? Carbon. And? Hydrogen. And hydrogens, right? So we can do proton NMR on just about any organic molecule we want. Because we've got to have carbon and hydrogen, and hydrogen has this nuclear spin. And that's where we get this term, nuclear magnetic resonance. It's, we're looking at the nucleus, which is physics, actually. right? Chemists like to look at electrons. Magnetic, because of the magnetic component, and resonance. And we'll talk about why things are in resonance and not. Okay. Now, 
If I take a, a spinning proton and I create a magnetic field and I put them out here in the room, it turns out that these magnetic moments, which are represented <coughs> by these arrows, are randomly oriented because we don't have a strong magnetic field in this room. We've got the Earth's magnetic field, but it's pretty weak in general. And so you'll have protons that have their magnetic fields pointing this way, that way, that way, that way, that way, that way, in all sorts of ways. It's just randomly oriented. But if I take that sample of protons and I place them into a strong magnetic field, which is represented as B0, okay? I don't know why physicists do that. They call it B0, okay? But B0 is a strong magnetic field. This is like taking Delaney and putting her in an MRI machine. So what's providing B0? The MRI. The MRI provides the strong magnetic field. And that's what happens when they place you into an MRI machine, right? You can feel the magnetic force. And so that's B0. When you take an external magnetic field and you place the sample of protons in it, they cannot be randomly oriented anymore. There's only two possible states. They can either be aligned with the magnetic field or against it. They can't be aligned sideways to it or kind of cockeyed to it. or It's either with or against the magnetic field. And when we have discrete states for something, what do we say that that is? We say that the states are quantized, right? Quantum physics, right? Quantized. So we can either have the low energy state or the high energy state, but we can't have any states in between. It's either low or high, okay? And so when we place all of our protons in this magnetic field, we're going to have some that are spinning up, and we're going to have some that are spinning down. Now, just by looking at that um, cartoon there, which one is preferred? The one what? Lining with the magnetic field. That's exactly right. Okay? And so the ones that are against it are not the preferred state. So which one is the lowest energy state? Aligned with or aligned against? With. That's exactly right. So we have this lower energy state and we have a higher energy state. And it turns out we can measure that energy state. Okay? So this is aligned with. See the arrows going alongside with the B0? I'm making this extremely easy because a physicist would cringe at this, right? There's all kinds of equations and stuff that go with B0 and all this kind of stuff. But for our purposes, we're going to use NMR as a tool. And all I want you to know is ha basically how it works. I don't want you to solve any physics problems here, okay? So this is the lower energy state, this is the higher energy state, and this is the change in energy. So how do we measure this change in energy? How could I measure that change in energy? I could do that. Or I could use energy of a particular frequency and measure this thing going from this energy state to that energy state. It, it must absorb energy to do that, right? Just like in the IR, what are you measuring? You're measuring how much energy really gets absorbed in that stretch, right? Or that wiggle or whatever it is that we're looking at, right? Same thing can be done here. I put in so much energy and I measure how much is absorbed in this happening. I can measure that. And it turns out that this energy band gap that you have here really is in the radio frequency range. So basically when we go and do an, an MRI experiment on Matthew, they place him in a strong magnetic field and then they bombard him with radio waves. And that's how they get their pretty picture. Okay? So uh, a lot of electronics, a lot of math, a lot of complicated stuff, but at the end you get a pretty picture that you can look at, right? And that's what we're interested in. All right. So in the absence of an external magnetic field, the difference between the energy states is zero. But as we increase B0, what happens to the energy difference in the... Does it get bigger or smaller? It gets bigger. So what's easier to measure, a big difference or a tiny difference? Big difference is easier to measure, right? It's a lot easier to measure a big difference. So if I take a tape measure and I want to measure out 12 feet, that's pretty easy to measure. I take the tape measure and I roll out 12 feet and I go here. But if I take my tape measure and I want to measure out a millionth of an inch, can I do it? Not very easy. Not with my tape measure, for sure, right? 
It's difficult to measure small differences, but it's pretty easy to measure large differences, right? And so for the longest time, chemists and physicists and companies were trying to figure out how to make better and better magnets so that we could have larger magnetic fields so that we could get better measurements in our NMR. When I started uh, as an undergraduate, we had what was called a 60 megahertz NMR, which was tiny in terms of magnetic field strength. And the lines were all kind of funky looking. And today we have huge field strengths, OK? And we can get uh, up to gigahertz uh, field strengths. The NMR magnets that we have in this lab, we have a 300 megahertz NMR, which is a high field. And we have a 400. Over in Polymer, they have a 500 and a 600. And by today's definition, those are tiny. When I was at Vanderbilt before I left, we had an 800 megahertz NMR, which was so large you had to have a staircase built around it so that you could walk up it to put your sample in. And it looked kind of funny because you're carrying this little tiny tube up the staircase to put it up at the top of, of this instrument. Today they have them that are one gigahertz in size and they still have to have a staircase for you to get up and, and put your sample in. Okay? But this is what a physicist would like to see, right? The change in energy is equal to all this crap, OK? And <laughs> basically, what's important for you to remember is, from my point of view, is that the change in energy is directly proportional to the magnetic field strength. So the larger the magnetic field strength, the larger the energy difference, OK? Is gamma important? Yes. You'll learn that in a higher level class. Is 2 pi important? Sure, OK? But I don't care that you know that here, all right? What I want you to know is that the bigger the field strength that you have, the better the data you're going to get. That's really what you need to know, OK? So this is what an NMR kind of looks like. And when we do, we're going to do a demonstration in here where you know that sample of the uh, oxymercuration, demercuration sequence that I did the other day? We're going to do an NMR on it. We're going to prove to ourselves that we made two octanol as, as opposed to one octanol. We can do that with NMR, OK? And uh, we'll actually be in this, la in this room, and we'll have uh, our guy come in, and he's going to actually run the NMR experiment so that you can see it being run on the screen in real time. And then we'll interpret it together, OK? But this is kind of what an NMR looks like. It's a can. It kind of looks like R2D2 in a way. Yeah? How hot does it get? We don't want it to get hot. We want it to stay cold. They're not, uh, well, you have to keep it at, at liquid helium temperatures because these are superconducting magnets. When you walk into the NMR room, you're in the presence of a, of a superconductor. So you all know that a superconductor has essentially no resistance, and the uh, electrical current continues to flow without an external field. Okay, And so you need to have these high field strengths, you need superconducting magnets. You can't use little bar magnets on your refrigerator, OK? Not even a bunch of them. You need a superconducting magnet. And so this big can is really a doer. The magnet itself is pretty tiny, really, OK? And it's located in here, and it's immersed in a bath of liquid helium, OK? And outside of that liquid helium bath is a liquid nitrogen bath, OK? So does anybody know why we have to have liquid nitrogen and liquid helium? Liquid helium is very, very expensive. It costs thousands of dollars for us to fill this NMR instrument, and we have to fill it at least twice a year with liquid helium. Okay? But liquid nitrogen is cheap. I'm breathing nitrogen right now, right? You just liquefy it and you got liquid nitrogen. Okay? So what they do is you have a bath of liquid nitrogen that minimizes the temperature difference from the outside to the liquid helium. So it helps keep the liquid helium uh, lasting longer. But on the inside, you have a liquid helium bath. And then you have your uh, magnet in there. Up here is the top where you will put your sample. And it comes down into the magnet. Uh, and there's a probe in here. And this probe is connected to a computer. And this computer allows us to uh, bombard the sample with the radio waves that we need so that we can get the uh, spectrum. And what you get out of that is what looks like a little squiggly line. Does that look like an NMR spectrum to you? Nope, not at all. That is what's called a free induction decay. So that's measuring how the uh, proton goes from the high energy state back to the low energy state. And you get this. 
And for those of you who have had Cal 3 and or differential equations, you've probably done a Fourier transform at some point. And what that allows you to do is go from this free induction decay or time domain into a frequency domain, which starts to look like an NMR spectrum, okay? I am not going to have you do any Fourier transforms. I can't even do them. I mean, the computer does it, okay? I mean, and that's how it works. Uh, I did not like Cal 3 myself. That's why I'm an organic chemist and not a physical chemist. All right, so that's the nuts and bolts of how NMR works. You need a big magnet, you need a computer, you need radio waves. All right? Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do right now is we're going to go through some of the just basic definitions of what you need to know. And a lot of this is just memorization at this point, okay? But you need to know that protons in different environments will absorb at slightly different frequencies, and so we can distinguish them by NMR. That CH3 that was attached to an oxygen versus the CH3s that were just attached to a carbon, they're in a different environment. Okay? We can clearly look at them and go, that looks different than those, right? So if we look at methyl terp-butyl ether again, these hydrogens are on a carbon directly bound to an oxygen. That's clearly different than these hydrogens which are on a carbon that's only bound to another carbon, okay? And so that's why they appear at different points on the spectrum, and so we can distinguish them, okay? And it turns out that the frequency at which a particular proton absorbs is determined by its electronic environment, how many electrons are near that proton. So if, I'm, if I've got an electronegative atom, that's pulling electrons to itself, not to the hydrogens, right? So that changes the electrons around the hydrogen a little bit. Okay, and so that's why we can see them, okay? Uh, don't worry too much about this. I don't really care if you know about that. Um, only nuclei that contain either an odd mass number or an odd atomic number give rise to NMR signals. So proton, what's the uh, mass number? One. It is one. And so we can see protons by NMR. Okay, what about carbon? What's the mass of carbon? Twelve. Carbon twelve we cannot see by NMR, but is carbon twelve the only isotope of carbon we have? What else do we have? We also have thirteen. Is thirteen an odd number or an even number? It's odd. So I can see carbon thirteen by NMR, but not carbon twelve. Can I see carbon fourteen? No. Okay. Uh, I can also see things that have odd atomic numbers if their mass number is even. So I can see deuterium. Deuterium has a mass of two, but it still has an odd atomic number. And I can see nitrogen 14 because nitrogen has an odd atomic number. Okay? So chemists can actually look at proton NMR, carbon 13 NMR, which are the only two that we're going to focus on in this class. But you can also do fluorine NMR. Who of you might be interested in doing fluorine NMR? They do use fluorinated stuff, very good, yeah. So, might be interested there. Those of you in polymer science, polyfluorinated hydro, or polyfluorinated molecules, right, are useful as polymers. They do fluorine NMR, okay. Uh, Dr. Wallace's lab does some phosphorus 31 NMR from time to time, because phosphorus is used in a lot of inorganic stuff. So, we can look at a lot of different nuclei, but for organic chemists, it's largely going to be proton NMR and carbon 13 NMR, okay. Now, one of the first things that you need to get used to is how to determine the number of signals that you anticipate a molecule giving, okay? So, for example, if I look at dimethyl ether, it's got two sets of methyl groups, but I'm only going to see one signal for this. Why? Why are they the same? True, and what else? They're symmetrical, right? There's mirror symmetry here, so this methyl group, the hydrogen on that, are equivalent to the hydrogens that are on the other methyl group. And so you cannot distinguish them. NMR can't tell the difference because they look identical. Okay? So we will only see one NMR signal. We'll just see a single line, and that's it. Okay? Now, if we look at chloroethane, okay, we will see two NMR signals. And why is that? <coughs> 
Excuse me? That's right. And what else? You're right. And the chlorine distinguishes, right? So this carbon with the two hydrogens is attached to a chlorine and a carbon. So those hydrogens are in a very different environment than the hydrogens on this carbon because this carbon's, the hydrogens on this carbon are only at, um, on a carbon that's attached to another carbon, right? So there's going to be two NMR signals here. Here for meth or ethyl methyl ether, we see that we're going to have three different NMR signals, A, B, and C. Why are these methyl groups not identical? That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. So you would anticipate seeing three unique NMR signals for this particular molecule. Okay. Now, when you're to trying to determine whether or not protons are equivalent or not, you really need to draw things out accurately. Okay. If you were to draw cyclopropyl chloride like this, you would not be able to determine how many signals you really should see. How many signals should you see here? Which two? So the hydrogen here will be unique, right? Uh-huh. And what else? Okay, so you're saying that there's a mirror plane that runs through here, right? And that these are going to be equivalent, right? That's true. This is going to be unique. These are going to be unique, but what about these? They're all, they're in a different plane. That's exactly right. These are related to one another, but this is not related to that by mirror symmetry. So I'm going to see one, two, three unique signals for chlorocyclopropane or cyclopropyl chloride. Okay? But if I looked at it like this, would I be able to determine that? No. Now, if you were to look at this alkene, you may not be able to determine how many unique carbon, or excuse me, proton signals you'll see. But if you draw it out properly, you can. How, ma how many unique proton signals should I see for vinyl chloride? Three, two, two, three, three, two. What do you think, Danielle? Meet in the middle, two and a half? Can you have half a proton? We do have three, and how do we know that we have three? So it's kind of cis to the chlor chlorine, and this one is kind of trans to the chlorine. So these two are not equivalent, are they? If I take this hydrogen and I labeled it with a Q, and this one I didn't label and I just switched them, I could tell that I made the switch, right? So that's right. We have three unique signals for that particular molecule. You're going to have to be able to look at a molecule and determine how many unique signals you could see. Because on my exam and on the ACS standardized final exam, if you can identify the number of unique signals, you're probably going to be able to eliminate half your choices. Okay? I am not going to give you a complex molecule and ask you to determine the NMR. That takes years of practice. Okay? We're going to be dealing with simple molecules using the basics. Okay? Here, we only have one NMR signal even though I have two CH2s. Why? Symmetry. Symmetry. They're all the same. That's exactly right. Here I have three signals. Why? One side has a chlorine, one side has a bromine, right? And so each one of these signals is going to be different. What would happen if I replaced this bromine with chlorine? Then I would have two. That's exactly right. I would have two signals then. For this molecule, I have two CH3 groups, but they are two unique CH3 groups. Why? All right, one is attached to a carbonyl, and the other one is attached to an oxygen. They are different. They are not going to be equivalent, right? Our good friend ethanol. 
you will see three NMR signals for this. You will see the NMR signal for the methyl group, you will see the NMR signal for the methylene group, and you will see the uh, signal for the hydrogen that's on the uh, OH functional group, okay? And you can actually go and get an NMR spectrum of vodka and you can determine how pure it is by looking at the NMR spectrum. That's actually a laboratory experiment that, that I did once when I was in, um, in college, okay? Uh, it was an assigned experiment, uh, it was not uh, something else, okay? So, when we start to think about NMR and interpreting NMR uh, spectra, the very first thing you want to do is count the number of signals to determine how many unique proton environments are in the molecule, okay? You're going to ignore the TMS signal at zero because that's a standard that we had to define zero. How many signals do we have here? We have three signals. They happen to be split, and that tells us something about the neighbors, okay? But we have three signals. So Matt's on an exam, and he recognizes, hey, there's going to be three signals, and he starts looking at the choices, and he goes, well, choice A should have six signals. Can that be his answer? No. Well, choice... B should have two signals. Can't be that one either, but then he goes, well, choice C and D could both have three signals. Now he has to start doing some additional analysis. But anytime you're given four choices and you take two away, odds are in your favor, right? You always want the odds to be in your favor. So do not forget good test taking skills and strategies while you are working these types of problems, okay? so. We know we're going to have three unique environments. Now, the second thing that you want to do is you want to use chemical shift tables to correlate the chemical shifts with the structural environments, okay? This is one from an old textbook that I used to use. You've got chemical shift tables in your textbook, but I'm going to make it even easier for you. You don't really need to use the shift tables most of the time. If you look at this, where would you draw a line that distinguishes different types of protons? Typically, a proton NMR goes from about 0 to about 10. And it just so happens that you meet in the middle at 5, and that's where you draw your line. Okay? So remember how we drew lines in IR? We're going to do the same thing on an NMR spectrum. Anytime I get an NMR spectrum, from one of my graduate students, I imagine a line at five. And I know that from to the right of five are going to be things that are sp hybridized. This hydrogen is on an sp3 hybridized carbon. This hydrogen is on an sp3 hybridized carbon. This hydrogen is on an sp3 hybridized carbon. Okay? And I'll also find some hydrogens that are attached to sp. So I know on this side I'm going to find sp3 and sp hydrogens. Okay? or hydrogens on those hybridized carbons. Okay? Why do we move down here as we, as we move this way? Because of the electronegative atoms. Right? So I know if it comes between about one and one and a half, it's just going to be an old-fashioned hydrocarbon. If I have something in this region, from about one and a half to two and a half, I know it's going to be a hydrogen on an sp3 hybridized carbon, but that carbon is going to be attached to something like a carbonyl or something like that. Right? And then here I'm going to have a hydrogen that's on a carbon directly attached to an electronegative atom, like oxygen, chlorine, bromine, etc. Okay? Just draw a line at 5. What, what happens from 5 to about 10? They're all sp2, right? So when you look at a, at a problem on the exam and you see peaks in this region, well, chance can eliminate anything that doesn't have anything that's sp2 hybridized. Right? He can do that because there's clearly signals, and if choices don't have those, we can eliminate them. Out here past 10, you're going to find things like aldehydes and carboxylic acids. They're going to appear between about 10 and 12, okay? More or less. Yeah? It does. It does. Well, you tell me how. <laughs> it sure does. And it's because the S character changes in the bond. Yeah. And there are some other 
what we call anisotropic effects. So you might argue, why does SP appear here and SP2 down here? It has to do with ring currents in the pi bonds, and I don't want to get into that, okay, with y'all. That's a more advanced class, okay? But for right now, you can kind of memorize this, and you really shouldn't need shift tables on an exam that I would give you, okay? This might be a good thing to put on your note card. Okay, kind of the rough regions where things appear. Okay. Then you're going to determine the integration of the signals. How many of you have had Calculus 1? You've done some integrations. What is an integration? It's the area under the curve. That's all it is. And it was a big aha moment for me when I was in college when I figured out that I could take a peak that is just a curve, a mathematical curve, right? I could actually cut it out, print it out, cut it out with a pair of scissors, and I could put it on a scale and weigh it, and I just did an integration. I figured out what the area under the curve was, right? Mathematicians like to sit there and, and hurt their brain with all these functions, right? But really all you have to do is know how to use a scale, okay? So it turns out that the NMR spectrometer has a scale that can measure the area under the curve, okay? And it gives us this line that we call an integral line. And all you have to do is measure here to here, and that gives you the integration of that peak. It tells you approximately the relative number of protons that give rise to that signal. I said relative, not absolute. Okay? Because if I look at this integration and I measure this, I see that that's one. That's the same height, so that's one. And that's about 50% bigger, so that's one and a half. What's the problem with one to one to one and a half? I can't have a half a proton, can I? So what do I do? I multiply everything by two. And so it's really two to two to three. And if I add that up, two, two, and three, what does I get? Seven. That's right. Right? Two, two, and three. So how many hydrogens are in the formula for this molecule? No. Seven. <laughs> okay. So this signal must be what kind of a carbon atom? It must have how many hydrogens on it? How many hydrogen atoms are on this carbon? And how many hydrogen atoms are on this carbon? Three. So what does this have to be? It has to be a CH3. This has to be a CH2. And this has to be a CH2. All we've got to figure out is where to put the bromine. It would be on this one. That's exactly right. You just solved your first NMR structure. Right? So we've got to figure out how many environments we have. Right? We need to use shift tables. We need to use integration. Right? But we also need to look at splitting patterns. Splitting patterns are going to tell us how things are connected. This is where it gets complicated for some people. Okay? We need to remember the n plus 1 rule. If I have a signal that is split into a doublet, that is two lines, like we have up here, how many neighbors must it have? One. The splitting is equal to the number of neighbors plus one. So to get the number of neighbors, you subtract one from the, from the, from the signal. So if this is a doublet, right, that's two lines that are of equal intensity, it must mean that there's a single neighbor. Okay, and that makes sense. HA, assuming that these are different, right? It doesn't tell us what's attached to it, so, but, but we're assuming that HA and HB are not equivalent. HA has how many neighbors? One, so it appears as a doublet. And HB appears as a doublet because it has one neighbor, right? And if they are in different chemical environments, there will be a pair of doublets in different locations. What is interesting is that the space between the doublet, if we measured that with a ruler, we would find that it is exactly the same distance as this one. Because these two protons are seeing each other, they are what we call coupled. And we can use that to determine which protons are neighbors. Okay? So we end up with two peaks. Here, however, HA and HB, we do not end up with a pair of doublets. We end up with a doublet, and we end up with a triplet. Okay? And notice that the triplet it's not, uh, all three peaks are not of equal intensity. It's kind of one to two to one. Okay? Why is HA a triplet? 
because it's got two neighbors. Why is HB a doublet? Because it's got one neighbor. That's exactly right. Pardon? So here's HA, right? These two hydrogens are the neighbors to HA. Okay, so this is, is this is just an arrow pointing. These two hydrogens are HB. Okay, so this single proton has two neighbors, so it appears as a triplet. These two protons have one neighbor, so it appears as a doublet. Mm -hmm. Here we would have a pair of triplets. HA is a triplet because it has two neighbors, and HB is a triplet because it has two neighbors. We're going to talk about that, and it follows Pascal's triangle, if you've ever talked about that at all in math, okay? But I'll tell you why, it's, why it is, okay? Why does it have positive charges in the carbon? Because we're not looking at the carbons. We're only looking at protons, okay? We're only looking at protons. Here we have... HB, which is three protons, how many neighbors do they have? How many neighbors do these have? One, One so it should appear as a, a doublet, and there it is. HB is three protons, it would give me an integration of three, and it appears as a doublet. HA would give me an integration of one, but it has how many neighbors? Three, so it appears as a quartet, okay? You need to know singlet, which is just a single peak, doublet, which is two peaks of equal intensity, a triplet, which is three peaks or splittings that are one to two to one, and a quartet, which is these four lines like this, okay? So now we've got all the pieces, and we can put together this structure, okay? We've got our integrations, we've got the various pieces, and when we put them together, this is what we get, okay? So if we look at this one, how many lines do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Does that make sense? Should this be split into six? Yeah, it's got three neighbors here, and how many neighbors does it have on the other side? So that's a total of five neighbors, so it should appear as six splittings, and it does. So the splitting pattern matches up. All right, we're going to continue on this on Monday and then get into the carbon NMR stuff. Y'all really need to read this and start practicing. I'm going to open up the sapling homework on uh, NMR. There are also practice problems on NMR. You will not get good at NMR by the end of this class, I promise you, <laughs> okay? But by the end of next class, you will be better, okay? It takes a long time to get really good at this.